This will be the last lecture on sexual selection theory. In the previous lecture, we talked about intrasexual selection, which typically takes the form of male-male competition, where males are competing either directly or indirectly to get access to fertile females or to fertilize gametes. In this lecture, we're going to talk about intersexual selection, which typically takes the fo form of female choice. Female decisions have a large influence on reproductive outcomes. The females can first make decisions regarding how much and what materials to invest in each egg that they produce. In some cases, they can choose which male or males to mate with. And if they mate with multiple males, they also have the option of selecting which sperm will be used to fertilize each of their ova. And then once the young are produced, how much do you put into additional offspring investment? Uh, this typically takes the form of parental care. Given these female options, males have various ways they can influence the female's reproductive decisions. The first thing that males can do is provide resources to females. They may do this to influence which eggs the female will invest in the most basically just to try to sway the female to mate with the male that has the resource, or if the female has mated previously, to entice the female to utilize your sperm to fertilize her eggs. Males try to influence mate choice and egg fertilization patterns also by the display of elaborate traits and courtship displays. Let's first talk about how females can choose mates based upon what immediate material benefits they could get from choosing one male over the other. Males of some species use what are called nuptial gifts, food gifts that are produced to try to convince the female to copulate with a specific male. That's being demonstrated here with this hanging fly. Males hang from vegetation holding a insect prey item that they're using to attract females. And the prey size that the male is offering determines the copulation duration, at least to a point. As you can see from this figure here, there's a, an initial nice relationship between increasing nuptial prey size and the duration of copulation. But copulation basically levels off between 20 and 25 minutes once you have prey at least 20 square millimeters. So larger prey items don't necessarily give you longer copulation durations. And it turns out if you watch these flies in nature, those males that have these longer prey items, at about 20 to 25 minutes, they actually break off copulation, take their uh, nuptial prey to try to use that to recruit other females. And the timing of this makes sense biologically because in the laboratory, it turns out that it takes about 20 to 25 minutes for a male to completely inseminate a female. And so any longer copulation isn't doing him uh, any good, and he would be better off taking his nuptial prey at him, trying to get another female to mate with him. Here's one of my favorite examples of a nuptial gift. This is what could be considered the ultimate nuptial gift. Male uh, redback spiders actually sacrifice themselves as a nuptial gift. What the males do is they, during copulation, they crawl up to the female, insert their pedipalp that contains the sperm packets, insert that into the female's reproductive tract, and then somersault them, their body into the female's chelicera and wiggle around to induce her to, to eat him. And the reason he does this is a well-fed female is more likely to immediately lay her eggs using the sperm that she has and is less likely to remate. I guess the, you may be thinking, well, what's the other option? Why doesn't the male just try to find more females to mate with? Well, it turns out that there's a very low female density in populations of this species of spider. So the males, having found one female, are very lucky. Their chance of finding another female is very, very remote However, the chance that the female they just mated with will meet up with another male is pretty high. So the best bet from the fitness 
standpoint is to make sure that this female is less likely to want to remate. And if that requires you feeding yourself to her so that your life ends, well, your chance of finding another female was remote at best. And so really you have nothing to lose by giving your life in this situation. So those are some examples where females will choose their mate based upon immediate resources that are on offer, nuptial gifts. What about cases where female mate choice is associated with delayed resource benefits? How do females choose among males in these situations? What females typically do is pick males with the most extreme traits because these extreme traits are honest signals of some resource that they're eventually going to get access to, like a high quality territory or mating with males with really good foraging abilities that can translate into good parental care abilities and delivery rates uh, for their associated young. So what are some examples of these extreme honest signals? Many studies have indicated that bright carotenoid rich plumages in birds are indicative of better foraging ability. This has been demonstrated in house finches and blue tits. Male color and energetic kind of waggle displays indicate tail fanning behavior in sticklebacks. And tail fanning behavior is important in sticklebacks because males are the ones who guard nests of young and much of their parental care involves fanning, tail fanning of the nest to oxygenate the nest. And so the displays that the males have as far as this active wiggling display and the presence of bright red coloration is a very good correlate that females can use to differentiate poor fan quality males versus high fan quality males. Song repertoire size is important in some birds. In sedge warblers, larger repertoires are good indicators of males that will provide very good parental care. Males with small repertoires tend to not make very good parents and so this again is an honest signal of the male's ability. What all of these characteristics have in common is they're costly to produce and maintain. You can't have a bright plumage if you don't have good foraging. Um, you can't do energetic displays if you're not going to be able to effectively uh, fan a nest in the case of the sticklebacks and the large repertoire size takes a lot of time to produce and individuals tend to be older that have learned more songs and so again these are that you wouldn't be able to pull that off if you were not a high quality individual. Well, Let's move on to talk about situations in which females may choose among males that are providing absolutely no material benefits why would females even care who they mate with in these situations? What do females have to gain by choosing among males who provide no material benefits? Well, what they get out of it is they're trying to make sure that they're mating with the males that are the healthiest and possess the best genes in hopes that they're going to be able to pass on this good health and good quality genes to their offspring. How do females choose among males in this situation? Again, they're trying to pick males with the most extreme traits because these extreme traits are honest signals of a male's health and genetic quality. Studies of rock pigeons or uh, rock doves have indicated that healthy males are those that have uh, nicer, brighter plumage. It's a good indication of having fewer ectoparasites. And also males with fewer ectoparasites have more vigorous courtship displays. In the case of bowerbirds, the satin bowerbird, multiple signals indicate different aspects of healthy males and good genes versus uh, sickly males with less high quality genes. There are certain signals associated with the quality of the bower that a male can produce. The basic structural integrity or bower quality is a good indication of ectoparasitic load and larger body size. The number of decorations is also a good indicator of body size. The male's appearance uh, himself, the, the brighter the rump, the uh, fewer blood parasites the male has, uh, the larger his body, and the uh, higher quality his feather growth pattern. 
Wing covert brightness also is a good indication of uh, feather growth potential and just the overall plumage color uh, also strongly correlates with uh, feather growth potential. Studies of peacocks have indicated that the number of eye spots that a male has in his display train is a good indication of his overall good genes. So instead of looking at a specific aspect of male health or specific traits, this study examined the number of eye spots that males have and the final end product. What is the survival rate of the young that he fathers? And fathers with more eye spots produce longer living offspring, offspring that tend to have much higher survival rates after a two-year period. This is a barn swallow. Male barn swallows have uh, greatly exaggerated long outer tail feathers. And a study was conducted in which they did manipulations of the tail feathers to see how this influenced female choice. So they took normal barn swallow tails, uh, a group of a number of birds that had comparable tail lengths, uh, both in size and length, and then they broke them up into four different groups. One group was just an unmanipulated group. They handled the birds, but then they just released them and looked at their mating success. A second group, they chopped their tails in half so that they normally would have tails that were comparable in size to the normal group, but now you're giving them the appearance of having shorter tails. A third group, what they did is they took the tails that they chopped off from the shorter group and glued them on to the tips of a normal tail to give you these super longer tails. And the idea was to see if there was a difference in how females perceived these males and chose among them as potential mates. But again, given this is an experimental study, one of the important things that you would need to do is have an experimental control. In this case, what that involved was taking a fourth group of males that had comparable tails, cutting off their tails, and then immediately just gluing them back on so that they have about the same length as they started with, but they've undergone the manipulation itself. And here are the results from this study. If you look at tails in the different categories and you look at the time it takes them to convince females to mate with them, we call this the pre-mating period, the normal tails and the experimental control had comparable pre-mating periods which is a good indication that the experimental manipulation isn't causing some unexpected results and clouding your interpretation, the ability to interpret the data. But if we look at the males that had had their tails artificially shortened, it took them much longer to convince females to mate. And in birds, this would entail a, a pretty significant cost. For one, Nesting later in the season is oftentimes associated with lower nest success. And number two, probably the females that were available to mate at this point that had not already chosen another male could have been the lower quality females. On the other hand, on the other extreme, the super males, the males that had tails that were even longer than what is actually seen in nature, these the females loved. The pre-mating period was very small in this situation. Females preferred to mate with these males first. So long tail males mated faster and they also had greater fitness. Not only did they have greater fitness by a, being more attracted to females, but they had parasite resistance. They had fewer parasites and the offspring that they produced had fewer parasites, indicating that this really is good genes. Similar experiments have been uh, conducted on widow birds in which they broke widow birds of comparable tail sizes in, into different groups and tested them. And sure enough, the males with the, the artificially lengthened tails were able to convince more females to mate. This is a species in which males mate with multiple females, uh, have multiple females in their territory, 
and males with the longest tails were able to recruit more mates. There is the potential that females could choose among potential mates for truly arbitrary reasons. So could female preference be simply an arbitrary decision? That is a possibility under a model of sexual selection called runaway selection. This explains how a trait could start off modest but evolve to be extremely elaborate through this process of positive reinforcement that just gets carried away. There are some assumptions for runaway selection to be able to work. Males have to have genetic variation for the display trait. So if we're talking about long tails, there are males with long tails and males maybe with shorter tails, but there's a genetic difference between males of each category. Additionally, females have to have genetic variation for different preferences. So some females may prefer short-tailed males, some females may prefer long-tailed males, but the reason they have those preferences is because they're genetically programmed to have those preferences. So let's talk about how a trait could evolve through runaway selection. Well, initially, the trait that is under this process of sexual selection would have modest degrees of variation within the population. So we'll let's stick with the idea of tail length. You look at a, a population of ancestral peacocks, say, and they have varying tails, the males do. Some have relatively short, some have relatively long, but we're talking about still relatively short tails, and they may only differ in tail length by a few millimeters. But the males that have the longest tails have the highest survival rate. So females in the population who just happen to have the genetic programming to mate, want to mate with males with the longest tail are making appropriate fitness decisions. These are the females that are going to produce long-tailed males because, again, they're getting those genes from the males that they mate with. But the daughters that these females produce will also have their mother's gene for the preference of long tails. So basically what we have here is a self-reinforcing process. Both of these traits, the long tails and the preference for long tails, are going to be common in the population because of this greater fitness advantage of having a longer tail. The, the little box here is indicating the previous graph that I was showing you, kind of that initial evolutionary stage in this process. Eventually it's going to get to the point where all of the males in the population have a relatively long tail and they're all genetically the same. Any subsequent male that either comes in the population from another population uh, at a distant site or a male is produced that has a mutation that gives it a slightly longer tail, well that male is going to have a huge reproductive advantage because all of the females in the population have this preference for mating with long-tailed males. So males with these mutations are going to have this huge advantage. And the females are then going to produce sons from mating with these males that will continue that advantage. So again, we have this positive feedback system where every time there is a mutation introduced into the population that produces a slightly longer tail, that becomes the new standard by which all of the females judge all of the males in the population and they're going to select those new mutant males and that trait will spread in the population so tail length will continue to grow generation after generation as long as there is an input of new mutations that produce that as an option that the females can select. And eventually there may be a time when you reach kind of the survival optimum for the tail length. But at that point, any additional mutation that produces males with tail lengths that may give them a slightly decreased survival advantage, maybe in this region here, are still going to be highly preferred by all the females in the population. So despite now a survival cost associated with this, this trait, the system has basically hamstrung genetically the evolution to get longer and longer tails as long as these new mutants are put into place because of this 
genetic robotic response because they're programmed to pick males with the longest tails. And tail length will continue to evolve longer and longer tails with the introduction of, of additional mutants that increase that potential until the tail length is so long that the survival cost associated with having tails uh, exceeds the point at, at which mate attraction benefits uh, accrue. So uh, if a male has a tail that's so long he doesn't even make it to the breeding season, obviously that no longer is going to be a benefit. And that may be how we get things like modern peacocks today. So initially we were talking about how females can pick males in ways that will increase their fitness. They're making what appear to be smart choices. They're picking males that can either give them direct resources, eventually give them resources, or at least give them good genes for the production of higher quality individuals. Runaway selection is a very different model of sexual selection that basically says that is, if there is a positive feedback selection between a very tight female genetic preference, not necessarily a thinking type of, of mate choice, but just this genet blind genetic preference for certain male traits, then we can see the evolution of traits for a, a purely arbitrary uh, extreme traits um, because of this positive feedback system. And the fe it may not really increase the fitness of, of females by, by making these types of choices. Sometimes it can be difficult to determine female choice patterns. Females may mate with multiple males and actually have a stronger preference for one or the other, in which case she may selectively use his sperm to fertilize her eggs. We call this cryptic female choice. This is demonstrated with data from chickens in which hens eject sperm of low-ranking males but retain the sperm from dominant males. Now, if the female retains sperm for multiple males and selects only some of that sperm, the only way that you can actually establish male preferences uh, among the males that she mated with is through some genetic analysis. So this can be a very difficult process. Sometimes females do not have complete control of who they mate with. Forced copulations are not uncommon in the animal kingdom. Water strider males will overwhelm females and force them to copulate. Ducks frequently will do this, so this uh, figure here uh, shows three competing drakes uh, mating with a female. And these can be very violent uh, situations in which the, the males are fighting each other, but also holding the female down and, and uh, um, being very aggressive towards the female, holding her underwater, and in some cases, when the males kind of lose track of what's going on, they can hold the female under and she can actually drown. Obviously not adaptive uh, for any of the individuals in that situation, but it just goes to show how this forced copulation can be very violent. Uh, chimpanzees show forced copulation. Bedbugs show forced copulation as well. The males have uh, phallic structures that are basically uh, little daggers that they use to insert uh, their sperm in the uh, abdomen of females, as you can see here. So effectively, this is rape in animals. So let me give you an example of a situation in which it can be very difficult to distinguish between cryptic female choice and forced copulation. If you compare penis morphology of various primate species, if you look at monogamous species, they're relatively simple in, in structure. Where species have the pattern of females having multiple mates, the males oftentimes have spines and, and much more elaborate uh, penises. So this has led to uh, a couple of hypotheses. One idea is that the more elaborate copulatory structures are for more copulatory stimulation. Basically, the males are trying to convince the females to use their sperm. And there's been some uh, question of, of whether, um, say, 
uh, orgasm in humans increases the uptake of sperm of certain males versus others. So this kind of fits in that criteria. However, if you look at a lot of these penises, uh, they resemble more in, in the terms of, of weapons than anything else. And in some cases, these can damage and produce uh, painful swellings in the females. And in this case, what they may be doing is producing physiological uh, copulatory plug plugs. So it's, uh, males could be forcing themselves on the female and damaging the female's reproductive tract to prevent her from attempting to mate with other males in the future. And persistent males oftentimes overcome female resistance. But again, when this occurs, is this forced copulation or cryptic female choice? Fox squirrels uh, show these extended mating chases in the breeding season where a female will run and be chased by many males. Eventually, one ma and the males will fight among each other, throwing each other out of trees and ripping each other's tails off. It can get pretty violent at times. But eventually, one of these males is able to outrun or outfight the others and catch up with the female. But the female is, is running away from the males uh, this entire time. So when that male finally does mate with her, is that just the end of this forced copulation behavior or was the female basically testing the male? Um, maybe male persistence, inability to run faster, run harder, fight harder, is a good indication of his male quality, and she was just testing him, uh, in which case this is more like cryptic female choice. Another possibility of why the female would finally submit to a copulation in many cases of forced copulation is that it further resistance is just too costly. Uh, they go ahead and, and accept the copulation to reduce the risk, but then they may subsequently select which sperm from which male they use to fertilize their eggs. And if they have that capability, going ahead and mating, getting this trauma over with, uh, minimal cost associated with danger and time may be the best bet. Last thing I want to talk about is the situation of reverse sexual selection. It turns out in some species, males sometimes are the more choosy sex. And this is typical of polyandrous mating systems. We're going to cover this in the next section. In polyandrous mating uh, systems, a single female has pair bonds with multiple males. And in these species, males oftentimes provide most or all of the parental care and the females are then free to produce more eggs, seek out more copulations with more males, and, and have comparably more reproductive potential. Therefore, in these situations, we tend to see the sexually selected traits evolve in the females, not the males. The females have to convince males of their quality, and the males are more choosy. So here we have two birds of the same species. These are phalaropes, and if you didn't know the context of this lecture, you would probably guess that the bird on the left is the male, the brighter, uh, larger bird, and the, the one on the right is the female. But it turns out that that's the reverse in the situation. The female is larger and brighter. Females are evolving these characteristics, again, to convince males to mate with them, and the larger size and greater aggression is basically female-female competition. So it's reversed the typical pattern. We have female-female competition and male choice instead of female choice. Another example of this in Mormon crickets, males mate only a single time because they can only have the resources to produce one large, very expensive spermatophore. It represents about 25% of their body mass, and it's both a source of sperm but also a food resource for the females. And the females can mate multiple times and so they actually compete for males. Uh, they're competing for these males but really they're competing for these uh, resources, these spermatophores. And it turns out that males will reject small females. They don't have enough eggs. The larger the female, the more eggs that they can produce. And so that's why the, the males don't want to waste their spermatophore on small 
females. So in review, in this lecture we focused on intersexual selection which typically is associated with female choice among males or potential mates. And we talked about in, in most of these cases the extreme importance of males with the most extreme traits or the, the males that are chosen. Male choice can be due to differences in the ability of males to provide material benefits, uh, immediate nuptial gifts, or delayed benefits in the case of territories of different quality or parental care. We also talked about situations where females will choose among mates despite the fact that the, the mates aren't providing any material benefits to them. And in this situation, they're just trying to make sure they mate with the male that's the healthiest and can provide the highest quality genes for their young. And finally, we talked about situations where females may choose males based on arbitrary criteria that have evolved through runaway selection process. Then we talked about cryptic female choice, situations where females are being selective, but it doesn't appear that they are by just looking at the mating patterns. The, the females may be mating with multiple males, but still may be relatively selective in whose sperm they use to fertilize their eggs. We also talked about forced copulations and how there's a conflict of interest between the sexes. The males you know, are trying to go after quantity most of the times. The females are going after quality, but low quality males may attempt to force themselves onto females to fertilize their eggs. And if males are larger, then forced copulation is definitely a potential. But in some of these situations, it can be difficult to disentangle forced copulations versus cryptic female choice. Is the female basically trying to put up some initial resistance to the male's advances uh, as a way to test his uh, quality? And it can be difficult to uh, figure that out. And lastly, we talked about reverse sexual selection. In a situation where females mate multiple times, but males are limited in the number of matings they can have, males are choosy, and the females evolve the sexually selected traits, either to fight among themselves, female-female traits, or male choice traits, in which the females are trying to convince males to select them and not the other females.